everyone. Um, today is October 21st. So it is the International Day of Action Against Biomass. In simple terms, biomass are the trees and their products found around us. It is a community energy source. People in many of our countries uh, use biomass as a firewood for cooking. But in the age of climate change, biomass got a new demand that is for producing energy. Of course, some dental power projects use glyricidia um, and some of those short term crops. But developed countries such as United States, South Korea, Japan, and some of those European countries use wood pellets to replace coal in their coal power plants. So biomass from native forests is being touted in an innovative renewable energy that will decrease carbon emissions, which is not the case actually. Burning forest biomass release even more carbon than coal and is just another excuse for propping up the destructive and economically benefit the logging industry. So we see that the ADB Asian Development Bank energy policy also keeps supporting biomass energy. Today on the International Day of Action Against Biomass, we are urging all the public to join the International Day of Action for using native forest biomass for green energy. So let's listen to some of our speakers today on their experience and opinions about why they think it is bad energy. And we have a very good list of people, very impressive speakers coming from few countries in the Asia Pacific region. For this webinar entitled, Divesting from Big, Bio, Big Bad Biomass in the Asia Pacific region. We have a list of speakers from Indonesia, Malaysia, Korea, Japan, and also from few other networks. And I will introduce one by one for this important webinar today. So the first, let me introduce Mr. Yuyun Harmono. He's from Walhi, Indonesia. Walhi is a big network of uh, Indonesia and they have more than 400 member groups. And Yuyen is actually the energy and climate campaigner from Wali. And he has a decade of experience of working on the Indonesian forest issues, energy issues, as well as the climate issues. He's also the Asia Pacific focal point for the Global Forest Coalition. So Yuyen, you have the floor now. Thank you, uh, Hevanta, uh, and welcome to all of the participants. Uh, I will share my presentation. It would not be long, I promise. So, uh, I will share uh, with you the, the state of uh, a tree plantation uh, for woody biomass in Indonesia and the recent plan of the governments to uh, mix this woody biomass into the coal power plant. And they will claim it as a green uh, energy uh, um, and extend the life of a uh, coal power plant in Indonesia. So um, in Indonesia, we, we have what so called the tree plantation for energy. So it's so it's specific uh, a plantation that will produce uh, the, the the wood pellets. Uh, it can be sold in another country, but mostly for the uh, domestic use. So the existing uh, uh, land for growing this uh, uh, energy plantation is more than one hundred and fifty thousand hectare. Uh, the type of the plant uh, should be the same or equivalent with the calories of uh, coal. Uh, it can be harvested uh, in two years and it can be replanted in 15 years. Um, well, it's depend on the on the on, on the plan, um, but uh, the productivity 
the government is targeting between 20 and 70 tons per hectare. Um, in Indonesia, you do not a new permit uh, to get this uh, uh, you just have submit the business plan uh, to get acknowledgement for this uh, tree plantation. But what uh, we, we can see in the graph, uh, it's almost uh, all over Indonesia, and the biggest uh, the biggest uh, tree plantation for energy, uh, the existing one is now in central Kalimantan. And the second biggest one would be in uh, West Kalimantan. So Kalimantan would be uh, right now uh, have the biggest uh, tree plantation for energy. But what we are worrying is that uh, for the next uh, five, 10 years, there will be an expansion of this tree plantation. Uh, there will be an additional of more than 600,000 hectare. So it's, it's like uh, six times or, or, or five times from the existing one. And it will create a lot of, a lot of problem, uh, especially uh, uh, with the communities and indigenous uh, people who live in the, in the area or in, in the territory. Um, the biggest demand uh, would be for the domestic use. It be also and to the existing uh, coal uh, power plant in Indonesia. We have uh, around 52 coal power plant in Indonesia, and if we mix uh, with five until 10 percent of uh, woody biomass. then the wood biomass would uh, a gigawatt. I think 2.8 gigawatt is almost the same uh, energy, uh, you know, uh, that, cre that, that created in drugs, yeah? Uh, close to what, what drugs are uh, producing. So if all of the coal power plant in Indonesia uh, would be mixed by the uh, wood biomass, it's almost the same uh, energy output uh, with the drugs. This is stated uh, in the document of uh, our uh, state-owned energy company. So it's it's really official that they, they will use uh, this woody biomass as a strategy to extend the life of a coal power plant. We demand uh, clearly that all of the coal power plant uh, that will be built should be stopped the existing one should be early, early retired, but then in order to do so, the governments are still using this uh, woody biomass as a strategy to reduce the demand on coal. Uh, this is what we call the fault solution. Instead of uh, giving early retirement to the coal power plant, they will extend the life of coal power plant. Uh, if we use the the ten percent of uh, of woody biomass in coal power plant, uh, we will require to have uh, like nine million uh, ton per year, which is quite huge, and we're afraid that it will that it will be create an uh, expansion of uh, uh, tree plantation in Indonesia. We see the indication uh, right now. So in Siberut. Uh, in West Sumatra, a small island in West Sumatra, where uh, most of the inhabitants are indigenous community. And now they are struggling against the expansion of tree plantation uh, in Siberut. Uh, this Petebai uh, got a permit uh, in 2018, yeah? uh, around 19,000 uh, hectare of land that, that they will uh, use to plant uh, 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 wood uh, uh, crops, yeah, uh, for, uh, for 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 biomass. Uh, we don't know yet whether they're going to sell it to other countries or probably or mostly for the uh, internal demand uh, to burn it in the coal uh, power plant.
it will threaten uh, the life of the community, especially the indigenous community in Sibirut. Yeah, it will also uh, uh, have a have a environmental problem uh, there. As, uh, some of the concessions are overlap with the indigenous community territory, and uh, we we will focus on these uh, things to uh, uh, to say that the expansion of uh, of of uh, three plantation would be uh, have an environmental and social consequence uh, to indigenous community, not only in Sibirut but uh, for others uh, expansion in Indonesia. Thanks you for listening uh, my presentation. We can discuss later on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yuyun. So Yuyun brought uh, his experience from Indonesia about how the tree plantations are converting into energy and how uh, the local communities are losing their lands and, and the biodiversity um, and, and how the Indonesia is trying to, to expand the life of certain coal power plants by adding uh, wood uh, into, into their the burning process. So uh, again, uh, this is a, an, a webinar organized by Global Forest Coalition and the Environmental Paper Network and, and it's many other members uh, from Asia Pacific countries um, and in, in our region. Um, so there are few countries who are already uh, producing these wood pallets and, and that includes Malaysia and Indonesia. Um, and uh, you already heard the situation from Indonesia, but let me now introduce uh, our colleague from uh, Malaysia. And, and um, so uh, uh, our speaker from Malaysia is Margeshwari Sangralingam, she is from Sahabadala, Malaysia, Friends of the Earth, Malaysia. Uh, she is a very long time campaigner on um, environmental issues, forest issues, um, waste management issues, and chemical uh, issues. Um, and and uh, so you have the floor, uh, Margesh, uh, for sharing uh, your experience from Malaysia um, on, the, on the biomass uh, related issues. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you, Hemanta. Uh, only please go to the. Okay, hi, I'm um, a research officer with the Sahabat Alam Malaysia. Okay, so uh, in terms of uh, biomass, um, so Malaysia has um, a strategy. Yeah? Um, which was called the, the biomass strategy for 2020. Um, and, and later on right now, what we have is the green technology. Um, only you still have to go to the first slide, please. It's frozen. So in terms of uh, biomass strategy, uh, it is mostly it's for uh, palm kernel yeah? uh, and uh, oil palm residue. And what we found was uh, the pallet industry has started picking up. We do have, uh, I'm sorry, the slides are not working. Yeah? Um, so we, we do have the oil farm business, uh, uh, biomass, which is being used. And of, uh, energy. Can you change the slides, please, uh, Oli? It's like uh, frozen. Can we remove and share it again? So in terms of the uh, biomass strategy also, uh, okay, yeah. So the biomass development in Malaysia, uh, which is in the biomass uh, strategy uh, master plan for 2020, um, it was basically more for utilization of renewable uh, organic matters, uh, especially agricultural waste, including oil palm waste, timber waste, rice husk. Yeah. Uh, next slide, please. And also, they're looking for future use for uh, making pellets, uh, biomass uh, power plant projects. And uh, this also included uh, uh, base uh, incineration. Okay, the next one, you can see uh, what's happening. Uh, in terms of use of biomass uh, for the Malaysia's energy, <laughs> it was uh, very little. Yeah? Uh, in 1997, it was 0% uh, biomass for energy. 
And uh, right in 2017, it is 0.2%. And in 2020, we do not have the uh, data yet because uh, in terms of the energy statistics is not out yet. But in terms of the uh, plans uh, under our green tech plan, right now what they're looking into in terms of uh, uh, biomass uh, for energy is more of a municipal solid waste based to energy thermal plants and also uh, resource recovery from biogas and um, uh, from farm residues yeah, and waste. Okay, next please. But we do have a uh, huge wood pellet manufacturing plants in Malaysia, one of the largest one. Uh, this is uh, in a rainbow pellet uh, where we got the source from. It's a rainbow pellet. Yeah, and uh, it produces 300,000 metric ton um, per year. And this is basically uh, for local use and also for export. Yeah, uh, in terms of exports, we see the largest um, recipient of uh, Malaysia's uh, wood pellet is uh, South Korea. Yeah, and um, most of this, uh, um, next please, you can see in terms of the volume and also the destination, uh, South Korea is the, yeah, the largest uh, exporter of uh, Malaysia's uh, fume pellets. Uh, next is Japan. Next please. So you can see an increasing uh, volume of um, exports to Korea. So besides that, we also have uh, large tree plantations in uh, Sarawak and uh, Sabah, which is in Borneo Islands. And some of these are pulp and paper mills. And um, uh, for some reason, and there is also a uh, production of pellets yeah, from uh, these uh, pulp and paper mills. Um, next, please. We're just going very fast yeah, in terms of the exports. And in terms of um, future plans, uh, we find that there will be more exports to South Korea. And uh, some of these exporters, uh, because of the feed-in tariffs and uh, renewable energy certificates being uh, given, uh, driven mainly by South Korea and Japan, we find that uh, there will be more uh, uh, wood pellets being exported from Malaysia. Okay, so on our, from our assessment, can we please go to the next slide, please? Next. So what we think, any type of biomass, whether it's palm kernel or whether it's uh, wood pellets or timber waste, agriculture waste, this is all still uh, combustion technologies you're burning and putting pollution in the air, yeah? uh, and they call it green energy. Yeah? So, but in terms of air pollution controls, um, most of the uh, emissions from all these biomass plants or energy uh, power plants, they are less, uh, and are monitored yeah, in terms of the emissions from there. And it is eventually polluting our soil and water. Yeah? And they say that they have air pollution control technology, but what this basically means, it is transferring toxins from the air, yeah, which should be going to the air. It is uh, transferred to the ash and this ash is uh, actually landfilled. So this is also polluting uh, the soil yeah, and water where it is dumped. Some In some areas it is dumped indiscriminately uh, but in, uh, but when it should actually go to secured landfill, yeah, um, and so this uh, biomass uh, combustion of biomass, it's not clean, it's not green, and it's not renewable. And you will hear more from uh, our uh, uh, from our speakers from other countries. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, the next slide. This is just uh, some of our uh, staff of Sabah Alam Malaysia. Uh, their contribution to this day of action on a big biomass. Thank you. Thank you very much, Magesh. Uh, thank you for celebrating. Thank you for uh, doing all these actions uh, to mark the International uh, Day of Action against the biomass. Uh, so the story comes from Malaysia, Magesh shared. So it's not only the forest plantations like in Indonesia, but they also use the husk and coconut husk and everything, uh, any, anything uh, to produce the pellets. And the pellets produce in, in Malaysia, so they mostly go to, uh, to uh, South Korea. So the South Korea is consuming these pellets, but at the same time, the forest and the, and the biomass in, um, in Malaysia 
are, are, are losing and they are burning and they are converting. They, are, they, are, they, they introduce them as a green energy, but Magesh said they are not green energy. So let's go to Vietnam, uh, one other country uh, from the producing side. And uh, so we have here with us, Mr. Phu Xuan. Uh, he's a researcher and consultant uh, in, in Vietnam. He's attached to the Forest Trends Vietnam um, and, and serve as the program coordinator. So you have the floor, Phu. Thank you very much, uh, Amata. Uh, let me share my screen. First. Okay, here we are. Um, first of all, I would like to uh, thank the organizers for inviting me to share some of the uh, insights from Vietnam's wood pellet. Um, and uh, yes, um, my name is Phuc, I'm, I'm a, a researcher. Um, I'm not a campaigner yet, and I have just started looking into this area in Vietnam. So um, I will have a, another almost like two years to look more into this um, production and export in Vietnam. Um, I would like to start my um, presentation by um, using two figures uh, from Zor Network. I, I think you all familiar with these figures. Um, the first figure presenting the uh, um, um, examining the production and uh, consumption of wood pellets at global scales. Um, I just want to locate where Vietnam was in this context. So um, the figures from the environmental uh, paper network uh, um, presented that in 2017, Vietnam produces yeah, 1.6 million tons of, um, of wood pellet. Um, I think Vietnam uh, was the third largest producer uh, wood pellets producers at, at this time. This figure um, came from the um, yeah, um, Environmental Paper Network uh, projecting the uh, production and consumption of wood pellets in 2027. Now, uh, Vietnam is here, uh, meaning, um, yes, um, so the, uh, the network projected that by uh, 2027, six years from now, Vietnam would be producing, uh, Vietnam would be supplying about 3 million tons of wood pellet uh, to global market. Um, um, so uh, behind the US, the Canada, Russia, and uh, yeah, um, but um, so again, six years from now, Vietnam will be providing uh, three, um, three million cubic meter um, tons of wood pellets as projected by um, um, environmental um, paper network. Now, where does the Vietnam wood pellet sector stand? Um, this figures are so the, uh, um, the uh, Vietnam export of wood pellets um, from 20, um, 2013, up to August this year. Um, you can see that the, uh, um, the export production and export. So wood pellets in Vietnam is produced for export. Almost all wood pellets from Vietnam is for export. So the uh, production and export has been on the rise. Now I just want to draw the attention on the figure in 2020. So um, in 2020, Vietnam exported 3.2 million tons of wood pellet, valuing about 350 um, million dollars. Now this figure, 2020, um, 3.2 million is much bigger than the figure projected by um, Environmental Paper Network um, for, again, I just want to go back here. Um, so six years from now, they projected that um, uh, they projected that in six years from now, Vietnam will produce three million tons. But last year, so this is pre-COVID time, Vietnam already exported much more than that. Um, um, this figure shows the uh, export market of Viet Vietnam wood market, uh, Vietnam wood pellet. Um, so almost all uh, wood pellets from Vietnam is uh, exported to Korea and Japan. I think it's more than 95%. Um, the um, the uh, first three 
first five columns. So the export to Japan since um, from Vietnam since um, 2027 up to now, August, up to August um, this year. The second fifth uh, five uh, columns here uh, refer to the uh, export volume uh, from Vietnam to Korea. So Korea is much bigger market uh, of Vietnam uh, wood pallet than Japan. Uh, however, the uh, the level of uh, certainty in Japan is much higher than in uh, Korea. So if you look into the trade here from Japan market, um, the uh, export volume uh, uh, of wood pellet from Vietnam to Japan has been uh, on the rise very rapidly. Why the export to Korea is quite fluctuated uh, here. Um, this figure shows the uh, value of the Vietnam wood pellets exported to two major markets, uh, Japan and Korea. Again, the uh, value uh, trend reflects uh, corresponds the wealth to the uh, uh, trend in the volume um, with the uh, a lot of uh, certainty uh, uh, is obtained from Japan, from the Japanese market, and why they have, there are a lot of fluctuation in Korea. Now, the, the, there is a small group of exporters participating uh, from Vietnam participating in the export, um, even though the volume of export is, is big, um, three, more than three billion, uh, more than three um, million tons um, exported a year, but there are roughly about 70 to 75 export companies participating in export. The, uh, the number of exporters participating in, in the uh, in, in uh, Korean market is much larger than those who participated in in Japan and the uh, sorry it's um, and the companies are participating in both market is quite small and um, this this is a figure for 2020 what it means here is that the um, um, the export um, the uh, actors are participating in export um, is quite small um, you know, this slide, so the uh, export companies by scale. Um, so the, uh, the, figure, uh, the, uh, the figure from the left, uh, so the number of the companies participating in export by their export volume. Um, I, I wanted to, to, to draw, draw attention into um, this figure. So this is for 2020 um, based on Vietnam customs data. Now in 2020, we have a six large scale exporting company um, engaging in export, um, exporting um, almost the 1.9 uh, million tons of, 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 of wood pellets from Vietnam, accounting for almost 70% of the total, the country's total export. Um, at the other extreme, we have a, a large number of exporters uh, uh, with a very small scale uh, participating in the export. So um, they, they are um, so uh, forty-seven uh, companies are participating in export, and their export volume only accounts for four percent of the total the, the country total export. What it means here is that the export is a very centralized. Um, it's a very um, it's a highly dominated by large scale companies. Um, now, um, in the last couple of slides, I just want to highlight some um, strengths and weaknesses uh, associated with the uh, production and export of wood pellets from Vietnam, um, uh, or advantages uh, re referring to the uh, to the uh, um, uh, factors that are contributing to the uh, development or expansion of Vietnam wood pellets sector. Um, the first is, is a availability, availability of raw material as input. Um, so wood pellets in Vietnam is used from, is made from the waste or residues from, from, from wood. Um, so Vietnam has a very strong wood processing sector uh, furniture. Um, every year, Vietnam derives about um, 13 billion US dollars from um, wood product export, um, and the residues from from this se sector is is used for making wood pellets. Vietnam also have a large area of plantation, um, so part of the plantation timber goes to wood pellet, and probably um, some companies uh, use other sorts as well, like a rice husk and uh, 
um, trees, but and uh, other other um, coffee fields as well. Um, Vietnam, um, the investment in wood pellets is, is quite small comparing to, for example, investment in furniture uh, processing facilities. And uh, it does not require a lot of uh, sophistic, uh, sophisticated uh, technology. Uh, and this allows many actors participating in the production. Now, there's no record of the uh, processing uh, um, uh, uh, facilities. Um, um, focusing on wood pellets in Vietnam, but uh, some traders told us that Vietnam have to have um, about 300 uh, processing uh, facilities um, uh, across the country focusing on wood pellets production. Um, we also have a raw material uh, area, uh, basically wood processing cluster and also a plantation area close to seaport, which is the an advantage for export. That's why we see a lot of wood, um, wood pellets uh, processing facilities located in the coastal zone uh, um, close to the uh, seaport. Now, there exist concerns um, over the uh, quality and the, um, the, uh, the legality of the wood pellets um, from Vietnam. Um, and one, one of that is um, there's, there's, there's uncontrolled uh, raw material input um, regarding the legality and quality of the aspects associated with wood pellets. Um, there's a strong evidence of the few FSC claims. Um, and uh, I'm sure that um, yeah, some of us uh, uh, sitting in this workshop have been looking into this and probably um, we will be looking more into this in the future. There's a, there's a concern um, that the supply of wood pellets in Vietnam is, is larger than the demand. Um, demand here refers to demand from export market. Um, and this supply larger than demand drives the, uh, the uh, export um, price uh, um, um, really low. And it triggers a severe competition among producers and exporters as well. Um, the, the concerns is also about the uh, uh, some levels of uncertainty, particularly uh, related to Korea market. Now, the uh, final um, uh, concern um, from my presentation is uh, is about um, yeah um, uh, the uh, legality and sustainability aspects associated with wood pellets from Vietnam. Now, um, this information comes from the um, uh, Mighty Earth report that I'm sure that many of you are familiar with. Um, it highlights that um, it, it, it shares the information that um, it has the information highlighting that in summer um, um, 2019, Japanese the environmental NGOs, I know that is a friend of the Earth, began investigating allegations of Vietnam pellet suppliers abusing FSC COC. And there's, 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 a, there's a statement saying that Vietnam, Vietnamese pellets are alerted to contain high, highly toxic substance, um, which is polluted to the uh, export, um, to the users uh, and, and to the environment in the export market. And um, also there are, there are questions and uh, allegations regarding the FSC fails claims uh, associated with the um, products exported to um, um, Korea and Japan, uh, prompting the FSC uh, to, un, uh, to carry out the um, transaction verification. So um, this, is, this information comes from the FSC website and it's still there right now emphasizing that um, all selected FSC certif certif certificated wood pellets um, and related transactions in 2020 in Asia, particularly in Vietnam and Thailand, will be verified, aiming to map our wood pellets sub uh, supply chains and exploring the gaps and identifying the potential field claims. So this, again, the, um, um, the transaction verification currently undertaken by the FSC um, is based on the um, on the accusation or allegations of the uh, failed claims or, or or the export companies from Vietnam when exporting uh, the products to Korea and Japan claim that their product is FSC certified, but actually the accusation uh, allegation is that it's not true. Um, and FSC also stated on their website that certification bodies will then act on mismatching volumes by issuing 
corrective action request. Certificate holders may see their certificates uh, suspended or terminated if the uh, investigation determined um, if the operators are violated the regulation uh, violate the claims. So um, I don't have any concluding remark right now. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, I have just started um, looking into this sector in Vietnam. Um, I have an ongoing research looking into this, and I will be conducting conducting an in depth um, uh, study looking into supply chains of wood pellets in Vietnam. And hopefully, I will be able to share more insights with you later on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, it's interesting to see um, that how the community energy is converting into the corporate energy, um, and of course, the 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 maps um, shared by Fook, um, uh, which was produced by the Environmental Paper Network. Uh, they are showing that uh, in our region, Japan and Korea are the largest consumers of these wood pellets. And of course, we have a very good reason uh, to have this webinar in the Asia Pacific region to, to introduce um, what is happening with this biomass energy in our region and who are the producers, who are the major consumers. Um, and, and so we need to have a, some sort of an action, how to, to, to bring, uh, to, to control or regulate the situation. So um, we have already listened to three countries, Malaysia, Indonesia, and, and Vietnam, which are the producing countries. Now let's uh, move to some of those consuming countries, which is um, one, one country is Korea. And we have uh, with us uh, Ms. Sujin Kim from the Solutions for Our Climate, and she will speak on the state of biomass energy and sourcing in South Korea. Um, so, uh, welcome to the uh, to the webinar, uh, Sujin. Floor is yours now. Thank you, Hermanta. Um, yeah, let me share my screen. Um, and yeah, nice meeting you all today. And uh, thank you for inviting me to this webinar. Let's see, is this working okay? Yes, make it full okay. screen. There you go. Yeah, so um, I was requested to um, talk about the um, trends of biomass energy development and uh, biomass sourcing in South Korea today. So um, I'm going to walk you through a, a, a brief overview of the state of biomass in South Korea. And uh, yeah, as we have already heard from colleagues from Southeast Asia, um, Korea imports large volumes of biomass um, in Asia. And that was mainly um, because of our uh, renewable energy policy um, that allows uh, power plants to burn biomass and claim for renewable subsidies. So um, we have about um, 63 uh, biomass power plants, uh, including both co-firing and dedicated operating in Korea and four under construction. And there's actually um, five others being um, uh, planned. So um, the current install capacity um, is about 2000 megawatt and uh, that produces about 7.1 gigawatt hour um, of electricity um, every year from biomass only. And uh, that number, when you look at the, the graph under here, you can see that in 2012, um, when we just introduced the renewable energy policy, um, Eugene, since uh, then, sorry to disturb you. Uh, I, I think it's not moving. The power slides are not moving. Oh. Can, can you make it uh, bigger also? Full screen. Is it not full screen yet? It is oh. not yet. Maybe you can unshare and, oh yeah, it's working. Now, can you make it full screen? Yeah. Is it working okay now? Yes. Can you make it full screen, the, the views? Um, yeah, I've made it full screen, but I don't know why it's not okay, doing that's, it. That's, um, that's I fine. Think, um, you can, let me... you can move now. Please go ahead. How about now? Is yes. this any better? Very well, thank you. Okay. So yeah. Um, yeah, when you look at the graph, 
toe, um, uh, left, uh, lower left. This graph only shows um, electricity generation from um, forest biomass, which includes wood pellets, wood chips, and uh, bio SRFs. That's basically PKS pellets. And you can see that number is growing rapidly, about 75% increase every year. And uh, that was mainly because of the um, subsidies given um, on energy sector. So biomass, um, bioenergy is considered the second largest source of renewables in South Korea by electricity generation here. And um, so in 2018, uh, biomass was actually um, number one um, in terms of uh, electricity generation, uh, more than solar and wind. Uh, um, and the solar has caught up since then. And uh, it's been pretty consistent um, in 2020 um, as well. Uh, biomass was number two in terms of um, energy generation. And uh, we mostly use wood pellets um, imported from Southeast Asia. And uh, so as we look at it, um, so we, if we divide the electricity generation of biomass by um, different sources of fuels, so wood pellets uh, consist of mostly, uh, most of it 90% plus, and uh, followed by bio SRFs, uh, the PKS pellets, and then some wood chips, but very minimum. So all that was possible because of um, duplicate subsidies from both energy and forestry sector. Um, and uh, that was given to biomass. So biomass was the largest source of renewable for a very long time, um, since 2012. And uh, wood pellet and wood chips are eligible for renewable energy certificates. Um, so one uh, unit of electricity will receive one, um, receive a renewable energy certificate uh, varying from um, different fuels, but in some cases, um, they receive two uh, renewable energy certificates per unit of energy. Um, in that case, that is three times bigger than the, um, the same subsidy given to um, solar PV, large scale solar. Um, just to show, uh, share uh, with you the scale um, of subsidy here. And uh, the coal power plants here um, also receive um, government subsidies when they, uh, when they submit their plans to retrofit their old coal power plants that are nearing to retire and uh, either, either to replace fuel, um, some of their um, fuel um, to biomass uh, from coal to biomass. They are elig eligible for subsidies. And in forestry sector, there's um, subsidies given for reforestation after, after clear cutting. Um, so the government incentivizes um, clear cutting of our own forest um, to domestically source wood pellets um, to be burnt in power plants, which seems to me the disaster, um, a disaster solution for, solution for climate change, but they consider it as their carbon neutrality goal. Um, the biggest contribution to carbon neutrality goal, which uh, seems to be um, absurd. Um, so um, that's about 90% government subsidy. And uh, there is also subsidies for uh, reforestation for biomass um, on the economic forest development complex. And government pays about 60% of that. And uh, they also have been um, uh, subsidizing wood pellet boilers distribution for households, about 70% of that. And there is many other subsidies in forestry sector that are related. Yeah, um, let me move on to the next slide. So um, where are they coming from? We've already heard of this. Um, Vietnam is number one um, exporter to South Korea. Last year, about 2 million tons was imported from Vietnam, followed by Malaysia, Indonesia, Russia, Canada, Thailand, and New Zealand as well. Um, here, I also wanted to touch upon Malaysia too, um, because of not only Malaysian companies exporting to South Korea, but there's also Korean companies directly investing in concessions in Malaysia, 
subsidized by um, government money. So the Korea Forest Service actually gives free loans, basically free loans to Korean companies to go to Malaysia, um, run, um, run a plantation and bring back wood pellets. So I think some of that captures that volume as well. And uh, uh, yeah, in Canada, I wanted to mention that some of that volume is, uh, we confirmed that some of that volume is actually coming from, um, from the uh, west coast of Canada, British Columbia. And uh, yeah, South Korea also imports PKS pellets uh, from Southeast Asia. And, uh, but, but not only Southeast Asia though, um, because we also um, import agriculture residue based pellets from North America and um, Australia as well. Um, so the numbers um, here, there's some outlier numbers here from 2015 to 2017. Um, because we um, did not have a separate um, HS code for, um, for this uh, kind of pellets, bio-SRFs. Um, so that has all, uh, only been divided, um, separated in 2018 with wood, wood pellets. So um, before 2018, these figures actually include wood pellet imports as well. Um, but now that, that has been normalized. So about uh, 850,000 tons um, every year we um, import uh, bio SRFs. How about domestic sourcing? So domestic sourcing is increasing rapidly too um, because of the large subsidy that I talked about earlier um, that are bigger than solar um, PVs and um, yeah, so we've seen a, a, about four times um, uh, increase uh, between 2018, 2020, when it was first, um, yeah, when it was first introduced, um, sorry, 2021, um, I, the figure is missing here, it's about 500,000 tons. Um, so we're producing that much um, domestically and uh, the investments on a domestic processing facility um, has been growing as well. So we have about 23 um, pellet processing factories here um, listed in green um, are currently operating and um, currently under construction, the yellow one here, three, and then um, currently in pipeline, the gray. So altogether it makes about 27 facilities. And, and that um, has really been um, decoupled with a, a, a rapid increase in logging um, as well in the country, which concerns us environmental groups, but uh, it, and uh, general public as well. Um, so just to share my concluding thoughts on this, um, Korea biomass sector is heavily subsidized and without this policy incentives, biomass does not make any economic sense. And um, there is a, a growing awareness uh, among policymakers here that you know subsidizing imported biomass is wrong. However, there's very little consensus on subsidizing large-scale domestic biomass. Um, and uh, SFOC and other environmental groups, we advocate for um, an immediate stop on the issuance of uh, renewable energy certificates, which is the, the subsidies I talked about from large-scale biomass and uh, canceling the existing plans and revisiting um, the subsidy schedule based on the size of the utility. Um, and we hope to have a very close collaboration with the groups here, especially um, in the importing, um, sorry, exporting countries in Southeast Asia for research and advocacy purpose. And uh, we would like to build solidarity with local communities and Environment group, environmental groups um, who are living near um, biomass power plants in South Korea. With that, um, I will finish my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Sujin. Um, that's excellent uh, information coming from South Korea. And a few years back when uh, the yeah. Korean government decided to, to retire many of their coal power plants, we were very happy. But unfortunately, we see that some of those coal power plants now they are converting into biomass uh, plantations. And it is a huge amount, 32% uh, 
uh, electricity also uh, comes from the biomass, which is a huge uh, uh, environmental disaster to some of some of those uh, pellet producing countries, including uh, your own country, because your own country already uh, started produce, uh, producing pellets as well. Um, Let's go to Japan, uh, the other country in our region uh, using uh, wood pellets uh, for coal, um, coal power plant uh, generation. Um, and uh, Naruhito Sugiura, and he's from Friends of the Earth, uh, Japan. Um, and uh, so floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Hemantha. Um, hi, everyone. I am Naru Sugira with Friend of the Earth Japan. Um, I'd like to provide you with a, a brief uh, overview of the situation in Japan around biomass energy. So just like uh, South Korea or anywhere else, uh, probably uh, Japan has a subsidy system for renewable energy. Uh, the feed-in tariff a scheme, I'll call it FIT from now on, um, and biomass is included as subject to the scheme. And the introduction of the FIT, um, uh, it was introduced in 2012, uh, and this has led to a drastic increase of biomass power generation in Japan, and the number of biomass power plants um, has increased significantly um, since the introduction. And prior to the FIT um, introduction, the total energy capacity uh, produced by bio, uh, biomass power plants was only 2,300 megawatts, but um, it reached uh, 10,570 megawatts um, as of June 2020. And among those newly approved, um, about 8,000 megawatts, um, about 7,000 megawatts are assumed to be generated uh, by using imported biomass fuels. Um, and uh, just uh, 530 megawatts are from domestic um, wood biomass. So I guess this is a little bit different from the situation in South Korea um, that um, Japan is heavily uh, relying in on, on imported fuels. And one thing to note is that the total capacity of the power plants um, already in operation are just um, 4,670 megawatts um, out of 10,570 megawatts. So a lot of them are uh, still uh, in preparation. Um, moving on to wood pellets. Um, so this is the import volume of wood pellets in Japan. Um, the volume of imported wood pellets was only 71,981 tons in 2012, um, but it reached uh, 2 million tons in 2020. And currently Vietnam is the biggest exporter of wood pellets for Japan, um, and it's followed by Canada, Malaysia, and the US. Um, in addition, um, based on our research, uh, major Japanese trading companies and, and power companies have made long-term purchase contracts uh, with companies like Ambiva, Pacific Bioenergy, and Pinnacle Renewable. Um, so uh, assuming that uh, those contracts um, will be successfully carried out, um, it is expected to add at least 3 million tons of annual import from North America. Um, even though um, they are not um, the biggest uh, importer uh, exporters of wood pellets to Japan, um, uh, Taiwan. Uh, sorry, the the lines are a little bit off. Uh, but um, um, uh, countries like Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, the the imports of those from those countries are, are increasing as well. So in 2012, it was 393 met, uh, metric tons from Malaysia um, and 15 metric tons from Indonesia. Um, and the number, not the numbers has increased to uh, 160,000 uh, met, metric tons from Malaysia and 15,000 metric tons from Indonesia in 2020. And these numbers are expected to increase. Um, and moving on to palm uh, kernel shell, PKS, uh, Japan's import volume of PKS was approximately about um, 26,000 tons in 2012, 
uh, with the, when the FIT uh, was introduced. Um, in 2013, in increased to about 130,000 tons. And in 2019, it increased to about 2.45 uh, million tons, uh, which is a, a 92 uh, times of increase in seven years. And almost all of them are imported from Indonesia and Malaysia. And in particular, the volume of imports from Indonesia uh, has increased rapidly since uh, 2017 and accounted about um, for 78% uh, of the total volume in 2019. And it is considered that all imported PKS will be used as um, a fuel for biomass energy. And palm oil, um, according to trade statistics, uh, Japan imported about uh, 730, uh, 780,000 tons of palm oil in 2019, uh, mostly from Indonesia and Malaysia. And, and according to the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, um, of the about 7,000 megawatts that fit certified between 2012 and 2019. Um, it is estimated that 19% or about um, 1,400 megawatts will contain palm oil as fuel for energy. And once all of this is in operation, uh, 2.8 million tons of palm oil will be burnt annually. And, and this is about 3.5 times more than the palm oil that Japan is currently importing. Um, and concluding, uh, concluding remarks, so the idea of biomass energy uh, being carbon neutral uh, is still believed by the government and companies and the general public. Um, and, and we're trying to promote, we're trying to break that idea um, by um, exposing all these producing areas, um, mostly focusing on North America. But I uh, would like to hope uh, we'll, we're we're hoping to continue working with groups and in in Southeast Asia or East Asia, um, uh, most uh, in producing countries to spread awareness on this issue. Uh, we're also uh, targeting the the fit, the fit system, um, trying to strengthen the the guideline for for fit for biomass projects to ex ex to exclude environmentally and socially damaging uh, biomass projects from from the scheme. Uh, with that, um, I'd like to end my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Naruhito. Uh, so very good information again from Japan. Um, and it's interesting to see that not only the wood pellets, but even the uh, the the farm oil is also um, using for uh, burning and and, and generating um, an energy. Um, we already heard from three producing countries and two consuming countries. Actually, it's not really, but uh, Korea is also producing their own wood pellets as well. Uh, now the question here is what do we do um, i think that's what we are going to hear uh, now uh, from um, karen vermeer from environmental paper network environmental paper network is a, is a worldwide network of uh, more than 140 civil society organizations working together towards global paper vision and they're working on this uh, paper pulp industry um, and uh, so they are one of the uh, the organizer of this uh, uh, webinar, and there are many other activities happening today to mark this international day of action. And uh, so Karen, um, so is going to talk about uh, how do you do the divesting from biomass. So the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, and hi everyone. And uh, I'm Karen Vermeer. Uh, my apologies, I have some technical issues today and I somehow can't use my camera. Um, uh, so thanks for introducing me and thank you for having me here. It's been great to hear from the previous speakers and I, I hope I can add something of relevance uh, right now. So I coordinate the EPN finance working group. We have two working groups, uh, finance working groups, one on the pulp and paper industry and one on the biomass industry. And uh, what we do, we focus on the financiers behind um, those industries. So behind the, the biomass companies and the pulp and paper companies. Um, what I will be um, discussing today uh, in the next 10 minutes is uh, why we target financiers in general, and then focusing on the Asian Development Bank, uh, why we might want to target this specific bank, 
Um, I will briefly uh, speak about the energy policy of the bank and uh, the current the opportunities we currently see to influence uh, ABB. And last but not, not last but not least, a uh, proposal for a campaign on the bank. Um, next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so why should we target financial, financial institutions? Um, first of all, because uh, financial institutions profit from the companies they invest in uh, or finance, so they make money of it. And with that, uh, there comes a respons responsibility uh, of their own when it comes to responsible business conduct. In other words, uh, financial institutions should, should check um, where their money is going to and should ensure that it doesn't um, result in any uh, social and environmental harm. That's just uh, that's not just me believing this. Um, it's also uh, incorporated in international guidelines, such as uh, the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights and the uh, OECD standard. Um, next, um, if you, um, well, thirdly, if, if the companies, um, if biomass companies themselves are unwilling to change which they are, they often are, because what we demand from them, uh, stop putting biomass, uh, is in direct conflict with their business interests. Um, financial institutions could be an additional target for uh, civil society. And um, next to that, it has proven to have worked in the past, although it requires a lot of campaigning and work, of course. Um, next slide, please. Um, so, the Asian Development Bank, I will briefly um, discuss the bank as I'm sure you've all heard of it. Uh, it's a, multi, a multilateral development bank headquartered in the Philippines and uh, the ADB itself uh, defines, the ADB defines itself as a social develop, development organization that is dedicated to reducing poverty in Asia and the Pacific through inclusive economic growth environmentally sustainable growth and regional integration. Um, the bank carries, is stating that it carries, uh, carries this out uh, through investments in the form of loans, grants, and information sharing. Um, the ADB has 68 members, uh, of which 49 members are from the Asian and Pacific region and 19 members from other regions, um, all these members being countries. Uh, if you would like to become a member of the ADB, uh, you have to purchase, um, you have to buy shares of the bank and the amount of shares uh, directly corresponds with the voting power you have. So um, currently Japan and the United States are being the countries that uh, have the biggest voting power. Uh, they both almost have 13% of the shares um, by the end of last year. So why would we want to target uh, the ADB? Um, because traditionally, uh, the bank is a great financial mobilizer in the region. It controls a lot of public and private finance, trust funds, um, also from national government. Um, currently, the ADB has several running investments and finances uh, in biomass power projects. Um, and um, thirdly, there's a policy issue with the energy policy of the bank. Um, I will discuss that in more detail later uh, in a minute. Um, but for now, this could, uh, I think this could potentially open up um, the policy, the energy policy of the bank could potentially open up a lot of investment in bioenergy. And we might ha have here a chance to be proactive and prevent a lot of um, investments in bioenergy. Um, next slide, please. Um, so uh, the energy policy of the bank, um, the ADB just revised its energy policy yesterday. It's been approved by the board of uh, directors. Um, we, together with many NGOs, I presume a lot of you as well, provided feedback, uh, feedback uh, on the bioenergy issues of the policy. However, um, none of this was taken into account in the final version of the policy and it uh, resulted in a policy with um, more or less all the ingredients for a dangerous cocktail on the bioenergy front. Uh, the main issues um, with this energy policy is that it currently recognizes bioenergy as a renewable source of energy, and it's part of the carbon neutral pathway of the bank. Um, 
it can also intervene in the sphere of uh, traditional bioenergy through cookstove projects transforming into modern bioenergy. Um, it, it also calls out for uh, calls for a phase out of coal, which of course is a good way, uh, good thing. But um, on the other hand, it leaves uh, the door open for um, co-firing or um, uh, conversion to biomass. It, at least it doesn't rule this out. Um, also uh, on the uh, CCS front, the policy is written as if uh, BECs could be, could be included. Uh, which is something uh, we wouldn't want as well. Um, so the policy leaves open a lot of investment, post, uh, leaves open a lot of uh, potential investments in uh, bioenergy. Then on the other hand, uh, the ADB has a coal retirement project, uh, which is launched early this year. It's a consortium of uh, ADB, private banks, and uh, BlackRock Real Assets, Prudential and Prudential, which is an insurance company. Um, the goal of this project is to speed up closure of Asia's uh, coal power plants. Uh, it kind of seems to rule out bi bioenergy, but it's, uh, I'm not completely sure about this. It's, it's not really clear about it in this project plan. Um, so if anyone knows more about this, then please tell me or us after the presentation. Uh, I think it would be great if we could clarify this. Um, so, um, we have on the one hand an energy policy that um, recognizes bioenergy as a, a renewable form of energy and on the other hand a uh, um, retirement project um, that is kind of unclear about biomass, um, which I think uh, leads to an opportunity for us to influence the ADB. Um, next slide, please. So, uh, on the finance campaign side, I think my suggestion would be therefore be to um, uh, target the ADB and with the overall goal to prevent and stop investment in and financing of bioenergy um, in general, and then specifically with the ADB. Um, first of all, this would on the prevention side. Um, I think it's important that we understand exactly how biomass fits into the different strands of the ADB work. So on policy level, sectoral loans, private sector projects. Um, so we need to clarify that with the ADB. Then um, if we have that clarified, I think we should push the uh, ADB to um, publicly acknowledge that bioenergy does not, does not fit within its renewable energy policy. And here we have a window of opportunity because the current uh, uh, final version of the policy uh, has opened up a lot of potential uh, for bioenergy in the Asia Pacific, um, but it is yet to define uh, the, the contours of it. So it's um, a very general policy and um, I think the devil is in the details. Um, and on the device, divestment side, uh, as I told before, the ADB has several running uh, investments um, and financing in biomass power projects. And it could, of course, um, um, demand from divest, for divestment from the ADB uh, in these projects. Um, so uh, I think it would be great if we can discuss this further uh, with everyone in this call who's interested. Um, I don't think we have enough time to do that today, but a follow-up call uh, to discuss campaign campaign plans would be really great. So if you're interested uh, to join, um, please let me know or uh, put your name uh, and email address in the chat box of this, uh, this webinar meeting. And um, then we can see how we can follow up. Um, these were my two cents. I uh, hope they were uh, of relevance and I want to thank you for your time. And on the next slide, you can find my uh, email address if you have any questions. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, very interesting proposal. Of course, uh, 
Asian Development Bank, the, 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 the largest shareholders are the Japan and United States. Uh, so both of them are heavy users of uh, wood pellets or the biomass energy. Of course, Ka uh, South Korea is a very influential uh, member uh, because uh, I, I have found there are many, many South Koreans are working in the Asian Development Bank. Um, so therefore, I think all these countries are very influential countries. Um, at the same time, Indonesia is one of the, 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 the big shareholders of the Asian Development Bank, not uh, much uh, uh, Malaysia or, or, or Vietnam. Uh, but interesting proposal coming from you. Um, I think the what ADB policy says, uh, uh, point section 78 says ADB will support the use of advanced biofuel in DMCs to reduce their dependence on oil and other and their transport sector emissions. Liquid and gaseous fuel represent another important avenue for providing stable energy supply and strong energy from various renewable sources, including sustainably sourced biomass. Uh, the word they have used is sustainably sourced biomass, waste and various variable renewable electricity. Now, it's time to introduce our next speaker uh, is uh, uh, Mr. Hassan Mehdi, he is the international uh, chair of the International Committee of the NGO Forum on Asia Development Bank. Uh, he is from Bangladesh and his organization is called CLEAN, uh, the Coastal Livelihood and Environmental Action Network. Floor is yours, Mehdi. Uh, thank you, Ivanta. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit lucky that uh, Hemanta, my uh, earlier chair of the NG Forum ADB and Shopana Lahiri, the earlier IC member of NG Forum on ADB is here. So it gave me some, you know, if I miss something, they can contribute there. So already Karen, thank you very much. You have covered many, many things and I don't need to uh, go to the detail uh, as you already mentioned many, you know, points and issues, concerns. So ADB's new energy policy has been approved by the board of directors just yesterday on 20th October, 2021. The bank is not only a financial institution, but also a knowledge broker and also a policy influencer in the, in the Asia and Pacific region. Uh, and you know, uh, in six, uh, among the 63 countries, the South Asian three countries, India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan is the top five uh, borrowing countries uh, of ADB. So it's, it agrees that uh, the new energy policy agrees that, uh, that advanced biofuels can all play a role in transitioning the business areas that are more difficult to decarbonize, such as long range transport industry and space cooling and heating system. It's in article 28, it mentioned directly that it's difficult to decarbonize if they start it. But even then, the policy says that ADB will promote biomass uh, cooking stoves and convert it to the clean modern cooking stoves using alternative fuels such as liquefied petroleum gas and pellet gasification, gasification Article 56. And it also says that the, it, it will champion the deployment of sustainable hydropower, blah, 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 and then sustainably sourced bioenergy. So these options uh, will promote commercial plantation, failing forests, and create new greedy corporations under financial assistance of ADB. Then it says about biofuel also. In Article 78, Hemanta already mentioned. So centralized biogas units are also in their uh, plan. Uh, this biofuel industry will take the cultivable lands uh, from the countries like Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, uh, this type of countries and which are already facing food scarcity. Uh, already big companies have started uh, promoting commercial crops in these countries in the name of high valued crops or HY, HBC uh, in these countries. On the other hand, some research organization backed by big corporations are creating concerns about methane emission from rice production. And they are advocating for commercial crops in the name of crop diversity also. Article 95, it says that 
ADB will incorporate resilient planning into its support for long-term energy planning. Long-term energy planning will consider the impacts of climate change, such as hydrological changes, accelerated growth of biomass, with consequences for renewable energy production. The whole energy uh, policy as a whole uh, will promote the devastating plantation, collecting forest extractives, and failing tree resources in Southeast Asia, especially. And now I, I want to a little bit focus on the specific projects which we can work. Uh, they have uh, six technical assistance projects with $10 million budget and three development projects with budget of 114 million point, 114.28 million. So one of them are uh, Sri Lanka, promoting increased renewable energy deployment, energy efficiency, and power system resilience in Sri Lanka. That has options of bioenergy. Uh, research for demonstration of carbon capture, utilization, and exploration technologies in, just, in industrial sectors of Yunnan province. Uh, it's a TA project, $1.3 million. It's in China. And uh, another project in China, which is TA also, development of biomass power generation in rural areas of China. Uh, it's six hundred thousand million, hundred thousand uh, dollar. Mm, building capabilities of women's energy in Pakistan. It's uh, two hundred thousand dollar. Promoting advanced biofuels through high technology in India. It's two point five million dollar. So they have a uh, three large projects. Which one is uh, seventy eight point two eight million in China. Uh, one is in uh, Papua New Guinea, twenty five million dollar, and one is in. Uh, uh, Azerbaijan with uh, $11 million. So from uh, my side, I have very specific, some recommendations or some uh, uh, some action points from uh, uh, for the bioenergy uh, biomass working group. Uh, one is monitoring and critique on or more projects to challenge the ADB's narrative of biomass and biofuel uh, to ensure that the bank uh, is shaky to invest more uh, in these sectors. Second one is uh, uh, it's immediately, if we can, anybody can, uh, participation in MDB Paris Agreement Working Group meeting during the COP26, where they are going to open this uh, new policy and their uh, technical assistance projects and also the, uh, the uh, program or, or uh, the infrastructure projects. Uh, that's uh, the, and we can challenge the, them in that meeting. Uh, Bilateral finance institutes are uh, also very important because uh, banks like Exim banks will uh, use the ADB energy policy as a clean sheet for their projects. So challenging them is very important now. And uh, um, third thing is most of the UNFCCC members uh, till today it's 131 countries has submitted their extended national digital mind uh, contribution or NDCs, new NDCs, according to the Paris Agreement. Um, we should work on the national with the national governments to stop investments in biomass and biofuels, and and at last but not the least that uh, we need to build capacity of the biomass working group members in different countries. And one thing to uh, to be added that uh, the bank is not only uh, not uh, you know uh, in the policy the bank says that it is not going to finance anything which can extend the lifetime of uh, any coal power plant. So, so fuel mix, uh, biomass fuel mix with the uh, coal is uh, potentially not to be the, uh, not, not, not going to be the added by uh, ADB. Uh, that is, uh, you know, a very short uh, speech from my side. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, uh, Mehdi. Um, we already heard few speakers um, about the situation and uh, and also about the uh, the solutions that we can bring or uh, the struggles we can initiate. So um, so we can have few more minutes question and answers. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry that I, I didn't want to stop uh, the speakers, uh, uh, but uh, but I think we can extend a few minutes. Um, and uh, if you want to raise your hand, uh, maybe you can use uh, uh, the uh, raise hand uh, uh, mark, or otherwise uh, you can just uh, unmute and speak. Uh, Suparna, floor is yours. Yes, uh, 
all very good uh, presentations. Uh, and I, I have uh, some three or four points to make. As you can see from the, uh, uh, you know, the participation in the webinar, we need to raise uh, more awareness uh, and, and, and need much more awareness generation in this re region and among the civil society groups in the Asia Pacific as a whole, uh, mainly uh, uh, on, on what all the presenters have talked about, uh, seeing the uh, potential danger of uh, advancing bioenergy and biomass burning as renewable energy or use it uh, in terms of carbon neutrality. Second is um, we uh, really need uh, to establish a solidarity and support uh, mechanism between the countries in this region, between the groups who are working in the sourcing countries, such as today you have three Southeast Asian country presentations and, uh, and the countries which are actually consuming and there's a projected rise in the consumption of bioenergy such as Japan and uh, Korea. Thirdly, uh, there's a huge, uh, there, there is still left a number of countries with huge population uh, 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 who, where the uh, consumption of energy, if you see the disaggregated value, traditional biomass is, is, is huge. Uh, around 60% uh, such as in South Asia. And, and today, if you see uh, countries like India, which has already come up with a policy where uh, now India has almost one fourth of its thermal power plant, which needs to be overhauled or re retrofitted or needs to be closed down. Uh, as as these are being uh, seen as uh, you know uh, assets we, which are stranded, and the India government says that it will be mandatory for the thermal power plants to mix five percent of bio uh, biomass uh, uh, in it, and now and it is projected to increase to seven percent. So of course this this is the beginning. And if we don't act now, we will be uh, we will soon see uh, the the gro growth of bioenergy and biomass burning uh, in this region. And so uh, the, the the next step is to confront the financial flow into this sector. And ADB a, a being one of those uh, banks, as Mehdi has rightly pointed out. It is not only a financial, and, and we all know, and it, it, it has huge, it can use its influence in the political sphere, as we have seen in the uh, water, energy, uh, and transport sector specifically, how it, ADB has uh, been used to actually, uh, 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 as, a, as a break, through agency to uh, you know facilitate very sensitive reforms in this sector where the government it itself was not able to uh, make headways and so uh, uh, if you if you if you if you see the philosophy of the bank though it has its own policies but it says that it's driven by the uh, country government and the projects are country owned project. So the moment the national gov government, the country government goes for a project uh, and, and it, 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 it's merely a ADB officials will try to fit it into their policies. But you know, if, if India, Indonesia, Thailand want to have projects to ad advance biomass burning or bioenergy or conversion into bioenergy, uh, those will be financed uh, since they are country driven. So we need to be aware of, 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 of these uh, you know, equations within the region. And so 
not only uh, confront a adb but also confront other bilateral funds as well as the country governments and its public finance uh, that they should not uh, finance biomass bonding and bio uh, energy and so the divestment campaign has to cover all these aspects and so the Bi asia pacific biomass group has a lot of work in their hands now and one by one we should you know go into this but first thing is to raise awareness among uh, the people and the civil society in 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 the region as a whole that is what i see uh, you know our main work today thank you very much soparna um, and uh, uh, is there anyone anybody else want to speak either you can ask questions or maybe you can make your comment Uh, Oli, please. Uh, yeah, thanks. If, if no one else has a question, I have a quick one. Uh, yeah, also, as Shaprona said, thanks so much, everyone, for the great presentations. They were fantastic, so much useful information. Uh, I was very surprised to hear at the scale of the uh, palm kernel husk pellet industry. Uh, I knew it was a thing, but didn't know it was anywhere near as big as that. So I was wondering if anyone knows what the links are between the wood pellet and the palm kernel husk uh, pellet industry are. If uh, some of the same companies are producing both of them, uh, if some of the palm oil producers also have investments in the pellet industry, because uh, obviously those are, are really important links to be able to, to draw between different campaigns. Uh, thanks, Oli. Uh, do we have any answer to Oli's question? Is there any connection between the palm oil, palm kernel pellets and the wood pellets industries? Is, this, is it the same industry? Sujin has raised hands. Um, Sujin, please. Sorry, I was going to ask another actually, question. A okay, different please, question. Go please go ahead. Sorry. Oh, oh, I thought maybe. Do you, do you want anyone to answer all these questions? No, I, I, I think we can take your questions and then then allow somebody else to respond. Okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, I was going to ask one specific question to um, Yu Yun um, about Indonesia presentation, and then one general question to um, other speakers as well. So the first question um, is about the additional land required for replanting um, these uh, biomass, biomass um, plantations. And uh, you mentioned this, it's 600,000 hectares, which is enormous. Um, it's like similar to like how much Korean forest land, entire land is basically. Um, so if, if that's, does the Indonesian government know like where um, that will go to, for example, is it going to happen in existing forest land or is it, are they going to uh, allow like afforestation of like of new forest land like what what is the plan there or is there no no other plans so that's one quick question and then um the other question is um you know we're we're waiting for uh, cop 26 to begin um pretty soon and and there's um the leaders summit in the beginning of the cop um the first week and um, and one of the three themes I heard was uh, forests. So I was wondering if um, any of um, any of these, um, the countries present here, um, their ministries and governments are are um, trying to tackle any of the forestry agenda um, um, in the lead up to the COP 2016. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sujin. Uh, Yu Yun. Uh, the, one of the question was directed to you. Do you have any answer to that? Yeah, uh, thanks for the question, Sujin. The uh, additional 600, more than 600,000 hectare would be coming from the existing um, uh, license uh, for, uh, for, for the tree plantation. As I said in my presentation, they don't have to apply for new permit. They just uh, change the business plan that they will produce, uh, they will plant uh, a crops to produce the, the, the tree plantation for energy. 
but in other case uh, it's also possibility uh, for the you know directly apply for the permit for uh, the tree plantation for energy in the case of uh, in Mentawai that I, I presented also, they got the permit in 2018 and uh, they specifically uh, produced uh, three crops for, for energy. So um, it's depend on the demand, the demand from the domestic as well as the demand from, from outside. Yeah? If in this uh, negotiation in Glasgow that all, all of country agree uh, to using more uh, biomass as a strategy to get away yeah, uh, from, from, from all fossil fuels, then the demand will be increased as well. And we should stop that because it's not the solution. It's, it will be creating more uh, environmental problem uh, and social problem in the producing countries as well. Uh, for all the question, I think there is no linkage between the PKS and also uh, with, the, with, the, with the three crops. Uh, right now, yes, indeed, uh, we export a lot of uh, PKS to uh, to Korea and also to to Japan, but uh, they also try to introduce to using the uh, PKS uh, to fuel the 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 plantations, uh, especially palm oil plantations, uh, companies' uh, power plant, yeah, uh, or the or the mills. So, um, well, PKS is from quote unquote waste, it's not directly come from the from the, from the oil. It's different cases with the with the biofuel because it's biofuel that we use in Indonesia and, and what we export to the other country is uh, directly uh, directly coming from the from the uh, food uh, from from the bunches from the uh, palm oil bunches. But you know uh, the other one is 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 waste, so uh, that's why we we need to dis distinct this uh, two kind of thing. Thank you. I hope I am answering your question. Thank you very much, Yuen. Uh, we still need an answer for where are these pellets, the different type of pellets coming. Is it the same companies uh, in mall? Um, and also, Sujin also asked another question about uh, about uh, the uh, the three agendas that. Uh, ministerial meetings discuss one is the forest and and how they're going to tackle which countries and how they're going to do that uh, i can see peg uh, has raised her hand show is yours hello thank thank you hamantha um i can't actually answer the question about um the how the how the leaders are going to address those um three issues in including forests but it will be very interesting because i think it's uh, you know the uk is playing this interesting game of um of wanting to promote a whole lot of uh, activity uh, and and you know um nice nice sounding stuff about forests and the natural environment and and so on um natural solutions with their <laughs> upside downside um stuff but um but then they're also uh, one of the sponsors of the cop and one of their uh uh 12 top global investors that they showcased yesterday is drax which is the big biomass burning company in the uk um so it's going to be quite interesting um, what, what I just wanted to make sure people know on on this um, uh, event is that we are coordinating a biomass group at the COP, which will be between people who are there at the COP and people who are some uh, elsewhere. So we'll have, try and have a virtual connection. In fact, I'll be trying to do a virtual connection um, uh, leading this group. Uh, and we'll we'll meet every day and we'll basically coordinate our activities both inside the negotiations and the venue and outside with um, uh, trying to get on some um, something at the People's Summit and with um, actions, um, colourful actions and so on to draw attention to the biomass issue. So anyone who's interested in that, please contact me and I'll just put my email in the chat. Thank you very much, Peg. Um, I don't think we, we have the answers to all the questions, but uh, I want to thank um, all the speakers joined today. Um, of course, we have underestimated the biomass uh, issue in, in Asia Pacific region. Uh, today's uh, presentations uh, from our colleagues from Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam, um, South Korea, uh, Japan, 
um, and, and, and Karen from uh, EPN uh, and also Hassan Mehdi. Uh, so we heard a lot about why this issue is so important for our region and it is the producing countries as well as the consuming countries are in our region and, and uh, it is uh, being uh, uh, labeled as the green energy and it will be a solution coming under this net zero uh, or, or it will it can be justified under the carbon markets um, and all within the the climate jargon so they are just just trying to convert all the coal power plants into the, into the wood pallet uh, uh, the consumption and which is actually there are many many issues one is actually the people local people's energy community energy are going to lose and it will be in the hands of the corporation soon um, and also it is again burning it is increasing the 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 carbon dioxide um, and it's a greenhouse gas again uh, so they are not green um, and uh, so uh, the countries uh, big countries are behind at the same time there are drivers like the asian development bank asian development bank has a big uh, control on this market and and they definitely um, their big players are coming from uh, wood chip uh, wood pellet producer uh, consuming countries definitely that you can understand why the Asian Development Bank is still wants to keep uh, biomass as, as one of the green energy in their energy policy. So I think uh, learning from this experience and also now here we discuss about what are the solutions and where our energy has to, to invest and, 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 and how, how can we start fighting. Um, I, think, I think working on the inner ADB energy policy, um, we it is it is almost um, the finalized and we don't have much time now to change this policy but still i think it is a it is an unending process um, for um, adb a lobby we started fighting on the coal power uh, in 1990s uh, very early 90s but in only in 2021 may they have decided uh, they will not support uh, coal power plant. Uh, we continue to fight on the LNG and biomass and waste to energy and all of them are still in our, our agenda. And uh, so let me thank uh, all the speakers today, um, join and share your very good uh, presentations. And also let me also thank all the uh, participants today. And uh, so um, I, I hope this uh, webinar gave a lot of information for you um, to how to continue your fight. Um, and also, I want to thank uh, Suparna Lahiri, Oliver Munian, and Sophie uh, for organizing um, this, this event. And finally, I want to thank uh, all the technical people behind uh, organizing this. Um, and also, um, I want to thank uh, Global Forest Coalition and Environmental Paper Network. Um, and we had a lot of speakers from Friends of the Earth uh, Network. Um, and also, I want to thank um, all of them uh, for, uh, for making this uh, very productive webinar. Thank you so much again. Have a good day. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Samantha, for great moderation as well. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank Samantha. you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, bye, everyone. everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.